All right, friends, welcome back. We are going to take a look at Revelation 13 today. We just finished Revelation 11, so we're at that midpoint. We've done Revelation 12 in the past. I will link it here below. Uh, but at this point, because we're at the halfway mark, I just wanted to do a recap of where we are up to this point. And plus, I don't like to have my videos focused on the devices of the other side. So I'm happy to introduce this topic or do this summary. So chapter one of the book of Revelation. And again, as I try to say over and over again on this channel, this book is so understandable. It is so attainable. We just need to spend a little bit of time with it and place it in context with the heavens, which is what Jesus told us to do while he was here on earth. I believe he made that reference uh, in many places, including Matthew 24. So we are in chapter one. Actually, let me pray. Lord, please bless the hearing of your word. Show us great and marvelous things. We worship you. You are worthy, dear God. We long to be with you. Help us to trust and obey and to learn and understand and to be wise in these times, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. All right, friends. So Revelation opens just telling us who the writer is and who this book is about. This is Jesus coming into his kingdom. This is the march into the millennial reign. Uh, we see many descriptions of who Jesus Christ is. There's a, there's a big difference between who he was on earth and who he is now in his glorified body. And then we get a brief glimpse into the seven churches that we're going to look at next, who they are uh, and what some of their struggles are. He also mentions the kings and priests. And this is who the, at least the first two raptures will be looking at. Uh, those who are ready, those who have oil in their lamps, most of whom are watching now. They know he's coming. They long for his appearing. And then jumping over to chapter two, we're introduced to the seven churches and that's where we are right now. Some people have studied these and said that they are ages and whatnot. You know, I think in part the way that this book has been presented has just been a, a big disservice to people who really just want to understand what God is saying about the end times. It's, it's hard when the, all this, these facts and information, you know, about Constantinople and Nero and all, you know, okay, but let's look at today what's happening now. So we've got, you know, most of these churches are in trouble somehow and they are risking losing that rapture experience unless they turn back to God, unless they repent. And we also have, you know, descriptions of who Jesus is, different um, aspects of him, different aspects of what people are going through. Uh, the teachings of the Nicolaitans, for instance, another uh, church is dealing with that woman Jezebel, Jezebel who is causing people to sin. And this is the church. The church was never perfect. God's never expected perfection, but he loves the church and he wants them to get it. He wants us to get this message. And that cannot happen unless we are in the word. So some of these churches, you know, they think that they're great and they think they're alive, but they're dead. Uh, one was lukewarm. Uh, another was doing very well, even under extreme duress and persecution. Another talked about defiled garments, how they had a few that hadn't defiled those garments yet, their garments, and they probably would be raptured. But the rest, maybe they took an injection. I don't know, but they would be left behind. Maybe they took a mark. God knows. Only God knows, and I'm not here to get too deep into that. This is just a summary. But again, just spend a little time. God has, you know, said, I have given her space to repent of her fornication. And she didn't. And 
yet, you know, we've got this time of tribulation so that we can repent of things. God's not unjust. He's not unfair. If you have an ear, listen. You know, I will give him the morning star. We've talked about that. That's Venus. That's the fifth seal martyr planet. And God's giving us that warning as it comes closer and closer to the horizon. Get to safety. Get to safety. And that's at sunset, that sign. Closer and closer to the horizon at sunset. Uh, we also have a warning about 10 days. And that will likely be extreme persecution. Yeah, we see here that the church of Smyrna would be in tribulation for 10 days. And this may be a general number conveying that the fifth seal will be intense for 10 days or maybe just a short period of time. And we see that in our timeline because there's just a month between the fifth seal and when the the fourth seal gets called into its um, manifestation, its full strength, and that's going to be death everywhere. The fifth seal, I'm sorry, the sixth seal after that uh, in March, that's just going to be hard times everywhere. Uh, so we see these different letters to the churches. It's not hard. It's not hard to understand and relate to. This book is very relatable. And then with chapter four, we talked here about the throne room of heaven and what some of the symbology was. The throne set in heaven, set in the creation, uh, the emerald rainbow, the northern lights or aurora borealis, and et cetera, et cetera. You can pause this if you need to, but these are things that we just really went into depth. The four beasts full of eyes, those eyes are stars. And those four beasts are constellations, the lion, Leo, the bull, Taurus, the man, Aquarius, and the eagle, Aquila. And we're going to look at that again, too. In chapter 5, we see the lamb who was slain. And that's Jesus. And so it's like this is a bit of a legal presentation. This is the one who is worthy of bringing about these judgments. We've got a justification here, if we will, not that we deserve that, uh, or we shouldn't even need it, but Jesus is the lamb who was slain. He went through these things. He is worthy of opening the scroll. And John wept and wept until he found out that yes, one was, and that anticipation, that buildup was there to prove you know, that God is holy, holy, holy. And just like the elders and the four living creatures, we need to fall down on our faces and worship him, worship him. All right. And then jumping over to chapter six, we've been over this numerous, numerous times. These are the seals as they open. And again, this is going to be opened by the lamb by the lamb that was slain, Jesus Christ. Uh, and we talked about how the seven seals match up with the seven planets of our solar system. It's really easy. It's very easy. We've got a black planet, that's Mercury. We've got a red planet, that's Mars. A white planet, Jupiter. Um, and then death and Hades, Saturn and Pluto. I mean, these are common uh, references in our own you know, nomenclature. So. These are things that, you know, they're very understandable. And especially when we tie this back to Matthew 24 or Mark 13 or Luke 21, we can see how these things confirm each other. And then heading over to chapter seven, we get kind of a break. So we're getting the scenes, we're getting the characters, we're seeing some background. Uh, the audience, the seven churches. So very doable, very understandable here. Um, and is actually more literal is what I'm finding. You know, once we do what Jesus told us to do and take into consideration those signs in the heavens. Um, 
and then we look at the 144,000. Again, this is symbolic of a number of people that will be resurrected uh, and raptured. There is a resurrection and rapture at the same time with that first rapture. There is a resurrection before the millennium, the resurrection and rapture. They are two different things. Uh, they just happen to happen on the same day or at the same time uh, with that first rapture. But we have two more raptures. Um, we see two distinct raptures in uh, Matthew 24, and then I believe that God is pointing us to three distinct raptures in Revelation 14, and we'll go into that, and that's, I think that you'll be blessed. We went into a study about how these names mean certain things, and that's just additional. You don't have to understand that to see what's happening, that God is choosing people uh, and setting them aside, preparing them for ministry. They're ready now for that ministry, and here's why. They kept themselves pure. Um, but we see how these things tie into each other, and we'll see that with uh, chapters 10 and 11 when we get into that, and really all of them. And then we've got this opening of the seventh seal. Uh, and some symbology, the altar, the incense, which God tells us the incense is the prayers. I mean, a lot of times he just tells us what these symbols mean. And the altar, there's a constellation that is of an altar, Ara, the altar. <clears throat> and then these are some of the judgments that happen when these trumpets are blown. Chapter 9, more, you know, descriptions of the trumpets, the fifth and sixth trumpets. And this is going to be, you know, a really bad time. At the same time, we see that there is a reference to darkness. And we know that there's a reference to darkness in chapter 24 of the book of Matthew with that second rapture. There's going to be tumult as well. And we see that also in Amos 8, uh, verse 9, especially that darkness will be paired with, with judgment. This is the day of the Lord. We see that in Joel 2. We see this in Acts 2. Um, don't pray for that day necessarily because it's going to be a tough day. Um, at the same time, this is post-trumpets one through four, this is post the sealed judgment. So in a way you wonder are, if the two witnesses would be on the earth at this time, because it's like nobody's going to be able to you know, know their own name, let alone understand what's, you know, uh, what testimony these witnesses have. However, we know that they are represented in the heavens as well with Justitia and Pompeia. We're going to go more into that after we finish this study and we'll see how our timelines uh, line up. One is a testimony timeline or a witnessing timeline, and the other is more of the judgments and the characters or happenings throughout the entire book. Uh, continuing on, verse 10, we get kind of a break here. And we've got a mighty angel that lets out this great roar. And we tied that to the constellation Leo. Now this is going to come into play after we get our description of the two witnesses. But again, this is very understandable. It's very reachable. And here, what we see at the end of the chapter is that John is given a little book, and we've seen that before in Ezekiel, in Jeremiah. If you haven't read these books, read them. Read Isaiah as well, because they're going to explain what it means to be a prophet. So we're talking about prophecy here. It tastes good. It, hey, it feels good. To, oh, I'm a prophet, you know, blah, blah, blah. But then once you're actually delivering these things, it's very bitter. It's bitter to your soul. It's bitter to the souls of those around you. And then that just opens up to the two witnesses. Easy. We have the introduction and then 
the two witnesses come on the scene. And then this, this isn't a novel. There are too many moving parts. There are the prayers of the saints. There are the actions, the deeds, the choices and decisions that people will be making during the tribulation, just as we saw with Nineveh. Their king humbled himself when Jonah came in prophesying. It wasn't because Jonah was such a great orator. It was that there was testimony in the heavens, in the sky. And that king understood what the Egyptian pharaoh did, you know, hundreds of years prior and hardening his heart and watching his whole country become ruined. The king of Nineveh said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to humble ourselves. So these testimonies, they worked together. People listen and we can pray to God that people will listen again today. But these are the two witnesses. Again, it's not a novel. We're not going to say, oh, the Antichrist did this and then the witnesses did this. There's just too many moving parts. God is trying to get us to turn to him and repent and he'll take these things away or lessen them. But we've got to be open and humble before him. There's no other way. There's no other way around it. And we also talked about the measuring of the temple and that could signal the last rapture. So again, we're going to go into that in uh, chapter 14, the three raptures. Chapter 12, we're introduced to the woman in the wilderness. It appears that there are two different versions of her. There are definitely two different stories, um, two different escapes. And we are also introduced to the red dragon. Now, it's super simple. The red dragon is China. They have taken on that, that name. And this is the earthly kingdom that Satan will at this time manifest himself. The first beast, there are two. The first beast, I believe, okay, he has seven heads, 10 horns, and seven crowns upon his head. And then this just, we're not going to go into great detail. We don't need to. All this tells us is that this is a government structure. It's going to have seven heads. And it's just going to be set up in a certain way. If somebody wants to delve into that, more power to them. And it may be needed in another setting, in another time. For now, suffice it to say that this is a celestial event with Satan being cast down to heaven. But it's also an earthly event with this earthly red dragon kingdom coming into their themselves coming into full power. And we see, you know, with Taiwan uh, having been threatened with invasion, with the Philippines, with Australia, that whole, you know, that whole side of the Pacific. It was, wasn't the China Sea until more recently, it used to be the North Pacific or South Pacific, one of those things. Uh, anyway, and then uh, verse four, and drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Well, Draco is a dragon or the dragon constellation in the heavens. And from October, like the first week of October, that's when we are in the Draconid uh, shower. That's when meteors from that direction come to the earth. That's when we're in that area. So that could be a timestamp as well. We keep praying over these things. Looks, listen, I've just been studying the book of Revelation in depth only the last nine, 10 months or so. So I'm not claiming to be an expert. I'm doing my best to help us learn these things together. I've been through the Bible almost a dozen times. I know God's word. I know how he speaks. Um, but for whatever reason, this is the time that he's choosing to unveil these things, at least from my perspective. And I'm sharing them with you. 